that's what God wants us to be here in Memphis, Tennessee. We need to be a catalyst for spiritual awakening, and we do that by loving Jesus Christ. church this morning. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord. So glad to have you here this morning.
walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lie. If you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life. Better life. You got pain. Good to see you guys out here this morning. Hey, why don't you turn, find a friend of yours, and just say, hey, I'm glad to see you in church this morning. Hope you found a friend. Hope you made a friend. We have four friends that are following the Lord in believers' baptism this morning, so let's remain standing. Let's remain in this attitude of celebration as we celebrate as they uh, make this public profession of faith here. Let's turn our attention to the baptistry. Good morning, church family. It's a reason to celebrate. We have four. All four of these have repented of their sins. They believe that Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose from the grave, and they have received him personally into our lives. This first young lady is Miss Akila Sweat. She is a non-hearing friend of mine, and we're up here with an interpreter so she can celebrate this time. She's only been a Christian for two weeks. Miss Akila, it's a privilege of mine to baptize you in front of all of these witnesses as my new sister in Christ. 
And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Jesus in his likeness unto death. Raised to walk in a newness of life. This is a University of Memphis student, Korean Sweat. I want you to know that it's a privilege of mine to baptize you today in front of all of these witnesses. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Jesus in his likeness unto death. Raised to walk in the newness of life. God bless you. The next couple is a husband and wife. This is Mr. Dennis Hall. Mr. Dennis, it's my privilege to baptize you in front of all of these witnesses as my new brother in Christ. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Jesus in his likeness unto death. Raised to walk in a newness of life. This is Miss Katrinka Hall, his wife. Miss Katrinka, it's a privilege of mine to baptize you in front of all of these witnesses that are celebrating today. And I baptize you as my new sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Jesus in his likeness unto death. Raised to walk in a newness of life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I have always been a seeker of knowledge. I've been involved in different Bible studies over the years, but I began to realize more and more that that's, that's not the end of it. Once someone comes into relationship with Jesus, if that's all God wanted, he would take us home right then. But because he leaves us here, there's more for us to do. So I started to focus a little bit more on what is it that God wants from my life? And it became a lot more apparent to me that God was actually transforming me into a disciple maker versus a believer. I knew that I needed to be involved in it, so I joined a discipleship group. And I get to interact with a lot of different men. And every interaction is a blessing for me. Every interaction is a growth opportunity for me and God's revealing more and more to me as I serve him and as other people pour into me. We're a Paul one moment, we're a Timothy the next moment, and we are always wanting to be Barnabas. We always want to encourage, we always want to uplift and hold people accountable for doing what we say we want to do. The biggest impact has just become in the accountability. Have you been studying? What are you praying about? We pray for each other constantly. So that level of accountability just makes you want to be better and do better at what it is that you're called to do. I went from being involved in no one's life primarily to being involved in a lot of different people's lives. God doesn't give you this stuff for you to sit on it. We've got to go out and share with other people too. You know, Christ said, go out and make disciples. He didn't say, now that you got it, go sit down and, and hold it. He said, go make disciples. So we've got to do what we were instructed to do. What God has done for you, he wants to do for everyone. It's an extreme honor to be able to share what Jesus has for everyone. So if you have the opportunity to share what he's done in your life, then you need to take that opportunity at every chance. Amen. Great testimony. I'm preaching today about making disciples, and I'm going to talk to you about how you need to grow and mature in your faith. And what you just heard Doug Williams talk about is something that all of us need to experience. We need to be in a group of three or four people where we're weekly praying together, 
memorizing scripture together, talking with each other, talking about how things are going in our lives, opening up, and not just living in isolation. And this is more than just fellowship. This is a discipleship group, and I'll talk more about that today. But Doug and others, we've got several hundred people that are involved in these things, and it's changing their lives. They are, for the first time in their lives, really reading the Bible consistently, learning how to pray, learning how to share their faith, learning how to read some very simple Christian books, two of them that I wrote. You know, if I wrote them, they're simple, all right? So uh, just but learning how to share your faith, learning how to do a lot of different things that help you become a better Christian. Again, I'll talk more about it in my sermon, but uh, let's thank the Lord for Doug and what a great job he did his testimony. Amen. Now, if you uh, would like to give, we're about to have our offering, and uh, let's pray together and we'll continue to worship. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. And we pray, dear God, that you would bless this offering. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And before we keep going, y'all go ahead and start taking the offering, but I forgot something. We're going to pray for somebody. We did it in the last service. You can go ahead and take the offering. That's fine. Uh, Pastor Zach Van Geisen uh, referenced me on Twitter and to told people that uh, I'd been a blessing to his life and uh, that I had mentored him through some of my sermons from afar. He starts his first day today. In fact, right now, in about 10 minutes, he's going to step up to the pulpit for the first time in his life as a pastor of a brand new church out there called Chandler Springs Baptist Church. Talladega, Alabama. Don't even act like you don't know where Talladega is, all right? <laughs> Everybody, when you even hear the word, it just makes you rev up your motor, doesn't it, all right? So let's, I want you to do something. I know we're, we're taking up the offering, but unless you've got that offering in your hand, let's all reach our hand toward this precious man, his wife, and their four kids, and you just pray with me as I pray for them, all right? God, I lift up Zach to you. I thank you for him. Lord, I remember that day in Lake Dallas, Texas, dear God, when I preached my first sermon as a pastor, and God, I want to thank you for him. Bless Chandler Springs Baptist Church. Set your spirit upon that church. Bless all four of those children. May they all be saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Bless Zach. Bless his wife. Bless their family. Bless that church. And God, let him be a catalyst for spiritual awakening as well. Give him a good day. Bless him now. Take all the butterflies out of his stomach and let him preach the Word of God through the power of the Spirit of God. And let him see people get saved today. I pray it in Jesus' name. If that's your prayer, say amen. Amen.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 28. In just a moment, we'll look at verses 18 through 20. We're in a series of messages on living like it matters. We only get one life, and then we spend eternity in either heaven or hell based on what we do with Jesus Christ during this short lifespan on earth. I know I just said a lot right there, but I hope that you're really listening. Your life matters. And so we're talking about what it takes to really live while you're on this planet. The first thing we talked about is Bible intake, that you've got to take in the Word of God. You do that by reading the Bible, by studying the Bible, by memorizing Scripture, by listening to it preached, singing it, all those things. And then you also need to learn how to pray like it matters. We talked about that. We talked about how to engage in spiritual warfare like it matters. We talked about connecting or fellowshipping like it matters. And we talked about sharing Jesus, that is, witnessing like it matters. Today, I want us to talk about making disciples like it matters. This is a big part of my testimony, so I don't know how to get into it without talking about it personally. Every Christian is a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're either a good one or a not so good one. You're either a growing one, a maturing one, an obedient one, or you're one that is not growing, you're not obedient, you're disobedient, and you're not very mature. But you are a disciple of Jesus Christ nevertheless. I was a Christian for many years before I began to mature spiritually. How many of you have had an experience like that? Anybody else out there like that? I believe with all of my heart that when I was seven years old, as best I knew how, I asked Jesus to come into my life. I received Him as my Lord and Savior. I repented of my sins. I believed in Jesus as best I knew how. I was baptized, and all that was great. But then, the rest of my, for the next 11 years, all I did was I, I went to church. Nothing wrong with that. I went to Sunday school, nothing wrong with that. I heard the Bible stories, nothing wrong with that. In the summertime, I'd go to vacation Bible school. I would paint the little paintings. I would play in the games. And I would also, you know, when they played the piano, dun, 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 dun. I'd sit down when they dun, 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 dun. I'd stand up. And, you know, I went through all the motions all the time. When I got in the 10th grade, I had never read the Bible. I never prayed except little rote prayers. I would pray at mealtime. And I got around some older football players that got me to start drinking beer. And uh, my life went south. And I was going to church, but I really got into a bad state. And I went with to church with people just like me. And in Dyersburg, we didn't curse, we cussed. And they cussed, and they drank, and they partied, and they did things they shouldn't do, and then they'd go to church. And I knew that something was wrong about that. But all I'd ever known was just go to church. And how many of you know that you don't drift toward the Lord? You drift away from the Lord. How many of you know that? Anybody know that? If you're out there drifting, you're not proactively pushing into Christ, you're drifting. And you only drift one way. You drift away from the Lord. And so I'm in school. I go to UT Martin. Things get worse because I'm away from mom and dad. I don't have to hide it anymore. I just go out and live in the world. I'd go to church. I was mad at God because I wanted to play in the SEC, and he, you know, he didn't keep me from getting hurt my senior year. I was talking. To, I'd already been to Mississippi State, been to Vanderbilt, about to go to Tennessee, as a, you know, just just to, to look. And they they were bringing me in to recruit me, and got hurt, and they everybody pulled away. It was a real rude awakening for a young boy that if you can't give them what they want, they don't want you. 
and go to UT Martin, full scholarship, start the first year mad at God, defensive end, start getting known on campus, you know, playing in the game, starting as a defensive end, one game led in tackles and all that stuff. People start to know who you are. And I was rebelling against God. I didn't want God, but I went to church every once in a while, and I'd go through the motions. I'd sing the songs, sing the doxology. But then I met some guys that really loved the Lord. They were disciples that were growing and they were reading the Bible, they were praying, they were fellowshipping, they were happy, and I had never met Christians like that. Not that I knew. I met one or two of them, uh, a guy named Phil Mischke, who's a lawyer here in Memphis. He, I was the right offensive tackle. He was the right offensive guard. He loved the Lord. Man, he loved the Lord. But he was one of the only guys I knew that really lived it while we were in high school. And so I start going to these Bible studies, Fellowship of Christian Athletes Bible studies, and I start meeting people that are really on fire for Jesus, and it changes my life. And I start wanting what they have, but I didn't know anything about the Bible. I, I'd never read it. I had never really prayed. I would, I would pray after I would do something I shouldn't do. I would pray and ask God to forgive me. But that's all I knew. That's all I knew. And so I get involved with these real Christians. I mean, turned on, love Jesus, knock you out on the football field, come back and lead you in a Bible study that night. But they loved the Lord. And they were sharing their faith with lost people. And they were growing and maturing. And I just wanted what they have. I, and I started reading the Bible for the first time in my life. In college, I started reading the Bible. I started reading the Gospel of John. I got to chapter 19. I got to that verse, I think it's verse 4, whatever it is, verse 5, whatever, right in there where Pilate brought out Jesus and they just beaten him to a bloody pulp and they mocked him and they said, behold the man. And when I read that, the Holy Spirit said, you want to be a man? You pick up that Bible. You pick up the cross. You, you follow me. You want to be a man? It's not about playing football. It's not about lifting weights. It's not about girls. It's not about partying. It's about following me. You want to be a man? You want to be a real man? It takes more guts to hold that Bible and walk across campus than it does to go to a party and do things you shouldn't do. And I can remember the last night I lived for the devil <laughs> or whatever was in Memphis. I went to a party, woke up the next day. The Spirit of God said, this is what you want? This kind of life you want? I said, no way. This is not what I want. I want, I want what those guys got. The Lord said, follow me. I drive back to Martin. I go to a country church. I'm the only one that goes forward. I totally sell out to the Lord. Have I been perfect since then? No. Have I been hungry since then? Yes. Have I yearned to follow the Lord? Yes. Have I pushed in toward the Lord? Yes. Have I started growing in grace? Yes. Some of you are just like I was. I used to think the Christian life worked for everybody but me because I just couldn't get it together. And the Lord said, you push into me, you watch what I do. You start getting around some other Christians. And you know what? I started hanging around people that I never thought were cool before. You know, I, I, I never thought, I would never hang around these people, you know, that, you know, they read books, you know, and stuff like that. Why would you hang around those people? You know, why, why would you hang around somebody that's not over here bench pressing and stuff? You know, why would you hang around with some guy that, you know, is a little guy over here, you know, but I started realizing it's not about all the athletics. It's about loving God. And he changed my life. And for the first time, I really started just embracing people. I didn't care if they were black, white, whatever. It didn't matter to me. Man, you love Jesus, I'm in with you. And I became a Jesus freak. And I would go to the bars still, but I was going there and I witnessed to everybody in the bars. You should have been there when that happened, man. <laughs> and God started changing my life. I got sick of football. I went to the coach and said, I'm out of here, man. Thanks for the scholarship. Thanks for everything. Thank you for a bad knee. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm gone. 
I go to Union. I'm going out. I start teaching a Sunday school class in Dyersburg at the Dyer County Jail because they're the only guys that would have to listen to me. <laughs> it was not very good, I'm sure. I start singing in a little band. We start giving our testimonies to all these youth groups. George Guthrie and I start going everywhere singing in bands. We sang at Leewood Baptist Church. We sang at other churches in Memphis. I start giving my testimony. I start feeling a call to the ministry. What's up with that, you know? I never, never wanted to wear a tie, never wanted to wear a coat. I don't like all this stuff. I'm a blue jean guy, okay? And yet I just want to tell people about Jesus. And then I get to meet Donna. Wow. And I start serving in churches, and my whole life has been changed because I realize it's more than just coming to church. It's more than just getting saved and baptized. It is becoming a maturing disciple. So let's talk about it. Last words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's the guy we follow. Amen? Amen. All these Satanists, they're following a loser, amen? The devil bows the knee to this man right here, Jesus Christ. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. Can I have an amen in the house of God? That's the great commission right there. What are we supposed to be doing? I just read it to you. I just read it to you. So, how's that play out? What do we do? How can we get involved in real Christianity. Number one, we've got to make disciples. Verse 18 and 19 say, Jesus came up, spoke, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore make disciples of all the nations. Now, the word make means there's going to be something new. My wife is a fantastic cook. She's always making food. And you can look at me, and I'm the living testimony of it, all right? And uh, when you make something, it, there's something brand new. When God makes you a disciple, He saves you. He, he changes you. You become a disciple. You get born again. You come under conviction. You know that your sin is real. You know that you've You've got to repent. You've got to turn. And when you do that, you believe that Jesus died for your sins, paid the penalty. Praise God, I don't have to pay the penalty for my sin because Jesus already did it. And he rose from the dead to give me abundant life on earth and everlasting life after I die. And so then now I just got to receive him by faith. I call upon the Lord and I repent and I say, Lord, come into my life and Wham! I become a disciple just like that. Has that ever happened to you? And then you need to go out and share the gospel with lost people and make disciples. Win people to the Lord. Paul said in Acts 8, 12, or, 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 or Luke said this about Philip. When they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Now, I, I don't want to in any way, I'm not trying to be ugly to anybody, but look at me. Nowhere in this Bible, in the New Testament, did anybody baptize babies. Don't get mad at me. It's not there. 
you baptize believers. And with all due respect, babies are not old enough to believe. Nowhere in the New Testament did any baby get baptized. That is not a scriptural practice. The word baptism, baptism is baptizo. It means to immerse, to plunge. Where I'm from, we would say to dunk. But it's winning people to the Lord. That's, that's what you do when you make a disciple. Somebody gets saved. Paul, the Bible says that when Paul and them were out in the missionary journeys in Acts 14, 20, and 21, but while the disciples stood around him, Paul, he had been stoned to death. I believe they prayed over him. He came back to life. He got up. He entered the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. Notice this. And as they, they had preached the gospel of that city, they made many disciples. They preached the, go- the gospel. And people got saved, which means they made many disciples. They returned to Lystra then and Iconium and to Antioch. So the first thing you do is you become a disciple and you start making other disciples. You start sharing the faith and winning people to Christ. There's a group of us that goes out every week down to Beale Street. Now, if that bothers you, don't let it bother you. I promise you it's okay to go to Beale Street to witness and to pray for people and to hand out food to hungry people. I promise you Jesus will go with you if you do that. Now, if you go down there drinking beer and you're going down there to get drunk and wasted, I'm not talking about that, but if you're going down there to be just calm, wear this little goofy T-shirt like we've all got on, says, stop, how can I pray for you? And you walk up and down there and you see people and they look at your shirt and some are drawn to you, it's amazing, and some are kind of, they just kind of walk away but they all see it. Don't make a big deal out of it. I, I, I'll guarantee you, I, I, I prayed for at least two or three dozen people the other night. Went, went up to one group, this young man, I, there, there are about 10 of these young guys. You say, how do you lead in, Brother Steve? I, I, I'm real, real gentle with it. I go, up, hey, I'm a Baptist preacher. We're down here praying for people. What, what can I pray for you all about? <laughs> let's just get it out there in the open, man. Amen. I mean, let's come on, bring it on. And so these guys say, this guy's getting married tomorrow. You want to pray for him? I said, yeah, let's lay hands on him and pray for him. So all these guys, you know, with, with, with all on Bourbon Street, not Bourbon Street, it's kind of like Bourbon Street. What is it, Bill Street? Yeah, whatever. I've been to both of those. And, and we got around him, started praying for him. One of our guys got to lead somebody to the Lord. We walked up and down there for two hours talking to people about Jesus. Now you say, are you telling me if I get saved, I got to go to Bill Street? I'm not telling you that at all. But I am telling you this, you got to start making disciples, which means you got to share your testimony. You got to start telling people what Jesus did for you. You got to not be ashamed of Jesus. You got to make disciples. You got to get somebody to where they hear the gospel and they want to get saved. And there's nothing wrong with that. Have you ever become a disciple of Jesus Christ? If not, do it before you leave this room. Have you ever then shared your faith with somebody? Have you ever shared your testimony with somebody? Say, this is what it was like before I knew Jesus. This is how I met Jesus. And this is what it's like now that I know Jesus. There's your testimony. Anybody can do it. And the more you do it, the more fun your Christian life is. Start with making disciples. Number two, then you have to mature disciples. You've got to mature yourself. Somebody's got to pour into you, and then you've got to pour into other people. It says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Here's where I missed it out as a seven-year-old boy. For 11 years, nobody taught me. I'm not saying I never went to Sunday. I went to Sunday school all the time. I'm I'm a testimony. You can go to church all you want to, and that's great. It's wonderful. But somebody needs to pull you aside and say, hey, here's how you read the Bible. Hey, let me show you. Let me take you through this. Let's read through the Gospels together. Let's pray together. Let's go witnessing. Let's, Let's fellowship. Let's worship the Lord. Here's how you do it. I taught all of our children how to drive. 
that will give somebody some wrinkles, I'm telling you. I remember those days when I was teaching them how to drive. You can't just do it in a room and say, okay, now, you know, when you get in the car, you know, you, you put it in drive. You can't do it in a room. You got to go get in the car and you got to go do it. How do you learn to drive? You drive. And somebody risked their life while you're learning. Amen? <laughs> Just so you can get a license so that their insurance premium will double. Amen? So, I mean, there's just blessings all around that whole experience. The more I think about it, the madder I get. So let's get off of it. But the only way to teach somebody is to let them do it. The only way to teach somebody how to mow a yard is to get out there with them and help them push the mower until they can push it themselves. The only way to do some things is to get in there with them. And the only way you're going to learn how to really be a Christian is if somebody that knows what they're doing and that's walking with the Lord gets ahead of you and said, hey, here's how you do it. And they pour into you. And you start to grow. And you say, oh, this is what all the fuss is about. This is why Brother Steve gets up there and hollers and hoops all the time. This is why we got choir. This is why people raise their hands. This is why people get happy because all of a sudden these old chains start breaking and you start getting free. And the old ignorance is gone and you've got knowledge now. And you don't just have knowledge, you apply it and it becomes wisdom. And now all of a sudden things are good, things are happening in your life. You're seeing yourself set free from some of these old strongholds you've been in and you're seeing some growth and you're seeing some maturity. It's kind of like when you want to lose weight and you realize i got to quit eating so much. And you get to that point, you say, you know what? I can wear that wrap thing all I want to. But when I take it off, the reality is still there. Some of y'all say, are, are you against my wrap? No, I'm just saying, keep it on. Amen. Keep it on. Keep it on. But the wrap's not your solution you got to stop eating so much. <laughs> Not many amens on that. All right. <laughs> and the Christian life, it's just getting these… Di- How do you mature? You discipline yourself for the purpose of God. You start reading your Bible as regularly as, regularly as you eat food. You start talking to God every day. You get a prayer list. I don't know how. You say, okay, get somebody that knows how and start learning how to pray. You start sharing your testimony with lost people. You start asking God to give you opportunities to share your faith. You start hanging around Christians, people that really love God. You start, you get away from the old stuff. You get involved in the new stuff and you start pushing in toward Jesus and all of a sudden you start lifting your hands when you're worshiping and all of a sudden you start closing your eyes and you realize there's more to this thing than I ever knew. There's more to it. When Jesus was a boy, he grew, he grew. When he was a little boy, the Bible says in Luke 2, 39 and 40, when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee in their own city of, of Nazareth. The child, Jesus, continued to grow and become strong. You know, you know what? It would be horrible. I've had four children, got 11 grandchildren. It would be horrible. It would be horrible. And by the way, we've got more on the way. Our kids think it's a contest or something. I don't know what's going on. But, but we, you know, it would be horrible to have a baby. I, just, just imagine that. We, okay, Bethany's born. She's the last one. And we've been in Alabama a couple of years, 1993. Bethany's born. We take her over to the crib and say, sweetheart, you're our fourth child and my Mom and I are tired. We're going to lay you right here. We're going to Florida. Here's a Bible. We're gone. Why, you, somebody have you arrested. But that's what we do with new Christians all the time. 
They don't know how to walk. They don't know how to talk. They don't know how to feed themselves. And we put them in a little crib, and we hand them a Bible and say, we're going to Florida. Take it easy. Grow in grace. And they're looking around saying, who's going to change my diaper? Because the Christian life, growth is messy. Did you know that? We just kept four children, grandchildren. Can I make a statement? It requires time. They don't always do exactly the way you want them to do. Discipleship, maturing is messy. It's about two or three steps forward and then you mess up. Well, I'm going to go back a little bit more and you mess up a little bit. Then you go a little bit more, but you're always pressing. You're going. Are you maturing in the Christian life? Do you love Jesus more than you did a year ago? Have you read the Bible more? Have you prayed more? Have you witnessed more? Are you hungering for the Spirit of God? I'm not talking about being a good little boy, a good little girl that comes to church and does right and says the right thing at the right time. I'm asking you, do you have a hunger for Jesus Christ? Do you have a longing for Jesus Christ? Is there the Spirit of God rising up within you? And when you hear these songs, there's this release in your heart. Yes, this is what I want to do. I want to love God. I want to love people. I want to share Jesus and make disciples. I don't want to just come to church and then go out and drink and do things I shouldn't do and live in the world and be a hellion all week long, come back and get a little little Christianity over here because I want to go to heaven, but no, no, then I'm going to go back to the world. No, man. Stop it. Get in the real thing. Get in the real love for Jesus. Start growing and maturing. It never gets old. You say, does the Lord ever get old? No, and Donna doesn't either. Amen. I love the same woman I loved 38 years ago, 40 years ago when we started, 38 years ago in marriage. And every week, every week, we tell each other we love each other. We have fusses like you and everything else. But you know what? Sometimes you kind of like the fuss a little bit because it's great making up. Amen? Yeah. You, just, you say, does she ever get old? No, she never, never get old. That's the woman I want to grow old with right there. And you know what? Jesus never gets old. The Bible never gets old. Prayer never gets old. When I played football, you know what we had to do every practice? I've been playing football eight years. We're still blocking. We're still tackling. We're still doing the basics. Why? Because you have to discipline yourself. What are the basics in Christianity? It's what I'm preaching to you about. It's what I'm talking to you about all this, this whole fall. It's all this stuff. Bible intake like it matters. Pray like you never get too mature to take in Scripture. You never get too mature to pray. It's warfare like it matters. You never get too mature not to resist the enemy. You never get too mature not to connect with other Christians. Some of you don't have any connections. You say, I'm a loner. No, you're not if you're a Christian. No, you're not. And that's you being selfish is what that is. You need to connect with other Christians. Whether you believe it or not, you need other people. You need somebody to encourage you, somebody to lovingly rebuke you once in a while, somebody to, to really inspire you. We all need people like that. You need more than just this room once a week. You need to get around some Christians in a circle looking one-on-one -on -one and saying, how's your prayer life? How's it going with you? How can I pray for you? I want to encourage you. And you're interacting with people and you're living, doing the Christian life together, making disciples, worshiping, family, managing time, managing money, loving people proactively and giving thanks. These are the things we're talking about. Those are the disciplines. And you never stop doing them until you go to heaven. That's how you mature. Okay. Real simple outline, you make disciples, you mature disciples, you multiply disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. How do I do that, Brother Steve? How do I, how do I multiply disciples? Well, here's the verse. Write it down, memorize it. Best verse in all the Bible, 
on multiplication. 2 Timothy 2, 2. I guess God knew that we'd need that simple little address so we could always remember it. Let's read it out loud, good and strong. Here we go. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In one verse, Paul speaks of four levels. First of all, he talks about himself, the things which you have heard from me. I got saved, Paul said. God sent Ananias, witness to me while I was blind on the road to Damascus. Jesus blinded me. I went to the three days later, I stayed in Damascus. Ananias came. I became a disciple of Jesus Christ. He said, okay, Paul, I'm level one, Paul. Paul got saved on straight street. Ananias witnessed to him. And he immediately then went and started serving the Lord. Along the way, he met a guy named Timothy. And this is just an, in, in this verse, we're going to go by this verse. Timothy is level two. Look in the verse, the things, Timothy, which you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. It's Timothy. Paul spoke to Timothy and to many witnesses. So you got Paul as level one, then his children, if you will, in the faith are Timothy and many witnesses. How many of you are trekking with me so far? You're with me on level two. Okay, now it's going to go to level three in the same verse. Entrust these to faithful men. Everybody say faithful men. All right, so there's the third level. Those are the grandchildren of Paul, spiritual grandchildren. You got Timothy, and the many witnesses are his children, and then they're going to go and take it and share it with the third generation, and that is faithful men. And then there's a fourth level, and that is others. Notice what he says, who will be able to teach others also. I'll never forget the first time I saw those four levels in that verse. I said, man, there it is. There's multiplication. That's multiplication. Man, I, you say, what's the big deal? I think we ought to just keep adding people to the church. The Bible talks about day by day the people were added to the church. That's right. At the beginning of Christianity, it was addition. But as you move on, it's multiplication. Multiplication. How would we get tens of thousands of people to come to Bellevue Baptist Church. How about if every single day somebody got saved and joined our church? Now, we'd all thank God for that. Amen? Amen. Let's say we had 365 people get saved every year, one a day for the next 15 years, whatever. Would that be awesome or what? Addition. But let's say there's just one old boy out here and he says, you know what? I'm not going after one a day. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But let's say he just says, okay, I'm going to win a couple of people to the Lord. And I'm going to pour into them all year. And then they're going to lead some people to the Lord. Okay, second year, man, look at me on the left. I'm adding. We're up to 730. This guy over here, he's got four. I got more people in my smallest class than this guy. All right, let's go to three year. All right, wham, wham, I'm over 1,000 now. I get to go to the Mega Metro Conference. And that guy's just, all these guys, eight little people over here. Bless his heart. Well, 1,400, man, now we're, now we're talking. Fourth year, 16, keep going, keep going, keep going. Whoa, wait, 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 what's going on here? What? Do you see? About year 12, everything changes. And by the time you get to 16, it's not even close. 
By the way, this is what they talk about when they tell you to invest long term in your money. That compounded interest, put, put that back on the screen so they can see that, please. Thank you. In 16 years, if we followed this and there was no break in it, you'd have over 65,000 people. And you know what? When you go to 20, it's unbelievable. We will do well to do it the way Jesus said do it. To make disciples, you have to multiply disciples. Here's what I'm talking about. You win somebody to the Lord, and then you mature them, but then you teach them to win people to the Lord, and they mature them, and you teach them to win people to the Lord, and then they mature them, and it starts spreading out like this. In about 15 years, you've led a million people to the Lord. Anybody in this room could get two people together and start doing this. You get, just get one person in you. That's two. And just start doing this. You say, well, what if a third person? You know, I don't think God would mind if a third person got in there too. It's okay. And you won't always have the perfect multiplication of everything. But do you see how quickly multiplication would happen? Look at me, guys. I don't really even feel like this is, a te- this is a sermon today for me. It's a testimony. I've been, I'm, I'm, when it comes to all this stuff, all these disciplines, all this stuff that, that what I'm talking to you about, this is not hard for me to talk to you about because this is where I found real life. This is where I found hope. This is where I really started getting the Christian life. And I'm just telling you, you don't have to be a preacher to do all this stuff. I did this stuff before I was a preacher. If, if, I, if you guys fired me, guess what I'd do tomorrow? I'd read my Bible. I'd pray. I'd witness. I'd fellowship with Christians. I'd worship the Lord. Because that's, that is the Christian life. You discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Why don't you get in the game? Quit, com- quit just coming to church once a week. And fall in love with Jesus, man. Fall in love with the Lord. You say, how do I do it? You can do it in a lot of ways, but one, we've got discipleship classes here. We've got hundreds of them. They are gender exclusive, and that means that men are with men, women are with women. They're groups of threes, fours, and fives. They meet all week, all different times. They meet once a week for a year. You learn how to read the Bible. You learn how to pray. You learn all those things. Read little simple books. I wrote two of them. If I wrote them, you know they're simple, man, all right? And so you just grow and you start, you become accountable. You meet people. You start praying with people. It'll change your life. If you want to know more about that, as soon as this service is over with, we got people right outside this door, right here on this main floor, and they'll be glad to talk with you. You say, I I just want to be a part. It won't take long. You don't have to go back there, do some interview. You don't have to give them your whole testimony. Just say, man, I'm interested in discipleship class. They'll take your name. They'll send you the material, and you can get started. Why would you go through life and not experience the real Christian life? Why would you go through life not reading the Bible? Why would you not go through life not knowing how to pray? Why would you go through life not pulling out of these sinful strongholds that you've been in all your life? Why, why would you do that? Why, why, don't you get, why don't you just dig in a little bit and realize there's more to Jesus than just coming one hour a week out of 160-something hours a week, 168 hours a week, come to church one. You think that's what Christianity, is that why Jesus died so you can come to church one hour a week? No. He came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. You might live in victory. So I'm asking you, The way to victory is to start growing and maturing and multiplying as a disciple. How many of you got it? Raise your hand if you got it. Okay, let's pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to make disciples, baptize disciples, and teach disciples all that you've commanded us. I pray it in Jesus' name. If that's your prayer, say amen. Amen. Let's all stand up. Please don't leave. This is not the time to bug out. This is the time to focus in.
The people that are walking out right now are the people that are going back to help with the discipleship folks. And uh, everybody else, please stay here. They're going to be back there to help you get mentored, help you sign up for those classes. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, you need to be born again. You need to become a disciple of Jesus. I want our pastors to come, and they're going to stand here waiting for you. And uh, you need to repent of your sins, believe in Jesus, receive Him as Savior and Lord, and that makes you a disciple. That gets you in the game. That gets you in the process. And then you need to be baptized. You need to go public. Can't be ashamed of the Lord. You got to go public. The way you do that is through baptism. You come and set up a time to get baptized. And then you start growing. You start maturing. And that means you get around some other Christians and you start pouring into each other's lives. If you don't have that, we offer that in the service. Go back there and check it out. And then you start multiplying disciples. You start mentoring other people. You say, me? You. The guys that mentored me, none of them became preachers. None of them became preachers. They're all godly laymen to this day. They love the Lord. And praise God, you can do this. By the grace of God, you can do this. I don't care who you are. I don't care, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what's happened in your life. It's not that I don't care. I'm just saying that doesn't disqualify you from making disciples. Nothing does. Nothing does. You can do this. You can have a big impact. You can leave behind a trail. You can leave behind a wake of thousands of people that follow the Lord. You can. You can. By just mentoring a few people at a time and teaching them how to do it. You're going to change the world. You're going to rock somebody's world. And, and, and families are going to be different forever because of what the Lord did through you. It's not just about preaching. It's not just about singing. It's about you getting in the game. Getting in real Christianity and pouring into people's lives. Quit living all isolated over here. Open up your heart. Open up your home, open up your life, and embrace people that need to grow and mature and pour into them and let people pour into you. It just keeps going. It just keeps going. It's awesome. This is the real Christian life, making disciples. If you don't know the Lord, come and give your heart to Christ. We'll take the Bible. Some of you have come and you've listened and you know it is time for you to embrace Jesus in repentance and faith. Look at me. Stop letting the devil make you put that off. Come down here and give your heart to faith in Christ. Stop waiting. Some of you are already saved, but you're waffling on the baptism. Quit waffling, man. If you've been saved and you've not been baptized, you get down here and you say, sign me up, man. I'm going under. And I'm coming out to tell everybody I belong to Jesus. And then if you've been saved and baptized, you want to join this church, we believe in multiplying disciples. That is at the heart of what we do. You come here and say, man, I want to be part of a church that wants to change the world through the Great Commission. Make disciples, baptize disciples, and then mature those disciples, and then multiply those disciples. That's what we're about. You want to be part of that? Come on and join. And if you just want somebody to pray with you, we'll do that as well. All you guys up in the balcony, thank you for coming. I, look, I know we got a parking lot on this side we can't even hardly use because that thing's messed up over there. I know you just about have to fly in here on a drone now. I get it, okay? I know it takes forever to get out of here, but you know what? I'd rather go somewhere that's crowded where God is moving than go somewhere I can get a parking place and where God's not moving. All right? Amen. So if, thank you for being here. But if you want, to, you want somebody to come, you want somebody to pray with you, you come. All you guys in the balcony on this side, you'll go that banner that says Savior. All you guys over here, you'll go that banner that says Wait. All you guys here, you'll come here. Let's don't wait. Let's move it. When, you, when, I, when we start singing, you step out and you come. And these pastors will be right here.
Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to make disciples, mature disciples, and multiply disciples. And help us to do it in Jesus' name and for all his glory. And all God's people said, amen. Let's sing. You come. Come on, sing it out. Sing it out. God Almighty. God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit. Conceiving Christ. Conceiving Christ the Son. Come on, we're singing what we believe. Jesus, our Savior. Sing it out. I believe in God the Father. I believe in God our Father. I believe. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God's three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. you glad that we're free in Christ? Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know what else to say to you. If you don't get out there and at least learn about a discipleship group, don't you dare say the Christian life doesn't work. No, you don't work. (laughs) Don't point to God 
when you're the problem, okay? If you want to grow, if you want to mature, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you're sick of just this little dab will do you stuff, if you want to get really immersed in Jesus and the Christian life, at least find out what they're doing back there, okay? Change your life, all right? All right, if you're a guest, I was going to say my wife and I would like to meet you. She's counseling with somebody. And so I'm all you got. <laughs> so if you want to, uh, if you'd like to meet, we'd, we'd like to meet you. Everybody, if you're a guest, I hadn't told you this, there's a little piece of paper in your bulletin. Fill it out. It says, let's get acquainted. And as you exit, there are welcome tables all around. As you go to your car, so you can wait a long time to get out because we only have two places to get out now. You missed that. But anyway, we're, we're, you, you, you hand that to them as you go out, and they'll give you a Bellevue gift bag. If you've got a minute, I'd love to meet you back here at Guest Central. And you bring that little piece of paper back there. I'll give you a Bellevue gift bag, a Bible promise book, and I'll pray with you. I'd love to meet you if you're a guest today. All right, Brother Jason, come and close us out, buddy. All right, also, if you are a guest today, we want to remind you, we have something called Explore 101, Lunch with the Pastor, that is happening immediately after this service. Some of you are already pre-registered, but we have extra space available. We would love to feed you lunch and then for you, for you to hear from Pastor about who we are as a church. What do we value? What are we about? What's our mission? What's our vision for this city and beyond? We would love to have you if you'd like to do that. If you just want to check out more of what Bellevue is, and uh, it'd be a good time to do that. That is out the back doors, and to, your, to my left, your right, we'd love to tell you more about it. Uh, so come back there and check it out if you're interested in that. Also, you have in your bulletin today something that talks about LEAD 501. I just want to put it on your radar. A couple of Wednesday nights from now, uh, we're going to be uh, having a time together where we're going to answer that question. What does, a, what does it mean to be a leader at Bellevue? You hear words like serve in and serve out. Uh, that's all part of leadership. What does that mean? How can we be the most effective leader possible? We're going to take one week and talk through that, talk about how that applies here at Bellevue. We'd love to have you for that. As Pastor mentioned, uh, we do have the challenge of the back entrance that is closed still. Uh, lots of people are asking when that will be open. The answer is soon. Uh, we don't know exactly when yet. They're working on it though, very diligently. Uh, so just be watching social media, emails. You guys will be the first to know when that is back open and usable, and we are praying that will be very soon. I know they're working hard to make that happen. All right, I want to pray for us. And uh, if you wanted to make a decision today, you wanted to talk to somebody um, more about joining the church or becoming a follower of Jesus, we'll be down front. We'd love to talk to you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this chance to be here today. Thank you for the message that we've heard. I do pray for the, the people in this room who are followers of Jesus Christ. I pray that, that they would take that next step to mature in their faith, Father, and to pour into others. And God, if there's others in this room who haven't come to that decision yet, I pray they wouldn't leave here today without talking with somebody further about what it means to know you, to love you, to believe in you, and to join you in what you're doing. God, we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen.